Uh, welcome, my name is Alauddin. On behalf of myself and my colleagues, Carolyn, Ryan, and Justin, I wanna welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. Um, please stay with us till the end. Uh, we're gonna try to be as time efficient as we can be. And uh, whether you're a municipality or an EV vendor or a regional planning organization, there hopefully is something of value to each one of you. Um, please type in uh, any question that you may have come up in the chat box and we're going to try to answer them as we can. Um, if you have any trouble as well, you can um, chat them, you know, uh, chat in your question or if you have any technical difficulties as well so that uh, Justin and Ryan can help you work through those. Um, and if nothing else, just feel free to email us later and we will be glad to respond to your email and, and answer your any question that you have. Uh, lastly, if you need to leave or, you know, before we're done, or if you've missed some of the slides or you get inspired and you think of others in your professional circle who couldn't make it today but would benefit, please remember that we'll be repeating this exact webinar on Tuesday at 11 Eastern time again. And hopefully also by the end of next week or the week after, we'll also be posting this PowerPoint uh, recording of one of the two webinars and the frequently asked questions. So uh, I know many of you have probably heard this many times before, but I always assume that there's going to be some first timers. We always like to start with a quick review of the overall VW program and of Ohio's approach to implementing it. Um, you know, so for those of you that may not know, in 2016, um, the, the United States and the state of California sued Volkswagen, um, basically for installing defeat devices on some of their vehicles. And as a result, they emitted somewhere between nine to 40 times more uh, of the, than the allowable amount of nitrogen oxides. Uh, in Ohio, we estimated that number based on the number of Volkswagens in, in our state. Uh, we estimated that they emitted about 300 tons in excess of what they were allowed to do. So as a result of that lawsuit, Volkswagen entered into a $14 billion settlement. Um, and um, mo uh, most of that, as you can see on the slide, about 10 billion of that Volkswagen is using to directly work with the owners of those vehicles. Uh, Two billion was set aside uh, for them to create a wholly owned subsidiary called Electrify America uh, that is putting in fast chargers across the country and the remaining 2.7 uh, billion dollars was allocated to states uh, to basically remediate the environmental impacts of those excess NOx emissions. Um, Ohio received out of that, uh, that uh, kind of state allocation, Ohio received 75 million dollars. Um, and uh, we, out of the 75 million, we were allowed to allocate a maximum of up to 15% for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And so that's what we opted to do. Now, I do want to point out that the remaining, the, the difference between the 75 and the 11.25 is allocated to replacing vehicles. And among the eligible replacements for vehicles uh, are all electric vehicles as well. Uh, all of this is summarized in Ohio's Beneficiary Mitigation Plan. Um, you, the plan is on our website. Um, you can see uh, the details in there. Um, one of the map that you see on there, it also it points out the 26 counties. Now these were selected based on um, some criterion, uh, including overall air quality and non-attainment factors, uh, areas that were disproportionately um, kind of suffered from the pollutants from the diesel exhaust and as well as where these Volkswagen and other cars uh, as part of the settlement were located. So those are, that's the list of the 26 counties. Um, I do want to talk real quickly about Ohio's uh, approach to public charging, uh, if I, excuse me, to EV charging. Uh, we focused on making EV charging funds um, available to publicly available locations only. Uh, the applicants can be government or non-government, um, but um, excuse me, there's a typo there, but oh no, there's not. So level two locations, when we did level two funding last year, uh, our focus was to meet local demands within communities uh, um, you know, across Ohio, and we wanted to use those funds to be able to deploy a number of level two chargers so that that would increase 
the visibility and increased awareness of electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging across the state. For DC fast chargers, our, our sort of priorities, if you will, are basically to help facilitate travel uh, across Ohio. And so where our focus is going to be on deploying these chargers on uh, along the EV charging corridors, as well as other major roadways uh, in Ohio. We're not saying that this is the only way to approach things, just saying that this is how we look at uh, deploying EV charging funds. So in terms of timelines, um, We've been at this for a while. We did some stakeholder meetings and now, wow, like what seems like about almost um, two, more than two years ago. Um, so where we went out and met representatives, uh, stakeholders in every one of the 26 counties and um, got this program kind of going. Uh, we've had a EVSE contract, a multiple award contract with DAS for anybody with or without uh, you know, th these funds to go ahead and buy EV charging equipment and services. Uh, that came up December 2019. Uh, there's a study, uh, a very good one, if you want to Google uh, Drive Ohio EV charging study, that was finalized uh, summer of last year and we were sort of a small part of that. Uh, last year, many of you may recall, we released an RFA for level two chargers. Uh, we're very pleased to say that that was a very successful effort, although, you know, we'll defer congratulating ourselves until after we actually see the chargers deployed and operating and serving uh, the people of Ohio. Uh, so this is where we are today, November 2021. We just released the DCFC RFA, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Stay tuned. Our next offering is going to be a $3 million electric school bus pilot project. So if you're interested in that, just stay tuned. Make sure that you're on our EV, um, uh, excuse me, you're on our notification, email notification list. Uh, I mentioned the DSEV uh, contract that's out there. Again, this is, you know, public in, uh, entities, uh, schools, colleges, local governments primarily are in there. Um, this slide is there for you to kind of reach back out to later if you want and be able to access those contracts uh, if you want to take a look at that. Um, so, with that, I mean, shift gears just specifically to this RFA that we're here to talk to you about today. As uh, you may have noticed, the application cycle opened on Monday, November 1st, and it's going to close on January 31st. Uh, we like to give our applicants a full three months to work on these so that we can get a really, really good high quality applications where there's been uh, coordination and stakeholder engagement uh, done and, and the partnerships are formed so that when you, by the time you apply, uh, you know, all those big pieces are, are in place. Uh, some timelines associated with this RFA, like I said, it opened on Monday. Thank you for joining today, the first of two webinars. We'll do this again on Tuesday. Um, and then I mentioned the Q&A being posted on our website, the deadlines up there. And um, April 29th, like we are thinking about giving ourselves three months to uh, review the applications and make announcements. But honestly, it all depends on how many applications we get, number one. And secondly, it depends on the quality of the applications we get. For the level two offering, we got maybe two to three times more applications that were anticipated, which was fantastic. But we also got applications that needed a lot of work on our end just to parse through them and kind of set the kind of pull them apart a little bit and make sure that they were kind of organized the way they needed to then rather than uh, you know just kind of reject those applications we put in the time and effort to to work through them and work with our applicants so that they you know stayed in the application pool and and many of them ultimately got funded as well so um Again, just big picture, this is DC fast charging only. Uh, no level two chargers are being funded as part of this. Um, you know, it's the same 26 counties that have applied that have been eligible for all VW funding. Um, we would recommend that you um, extend beyond the most populated counties. So if you look at the slide here, you know, there's $7 million, up to $7 million, um, will only fund really good cost-effective projects. Um, and there's, you see the, the, the difference in the coloring. Again, don't worry about the solid yellow versus the striped blue. 
Uh, there's not a preference uh, of first and second priority. As a matter of fact, it's going to be the opposite. So if you go into a county that has fewer publicly available non Tesla chargers, you're more likely to get ranked higher um, than those counties that already have um, several chargers. Again, the routine uh, disclaimers apply. Uh, we could extend the deadline if we see the need to. Um, we could make a partial grant or full grant or no grant, and we can also kind of, you know, depending on the applications we get, uh, we can also make program decisions that may be different than what we're what we're telling you here today. Um, funding uh, per charger. Again, the key language to focus on is government owned property. Everybody always asks us, hey, I'm a private entity. I'm a public entity. Can I get can I participate? How much am I going to get? Again, we try to stick as close to the settlement language as as we can so that when we seek reimbursement from the settlement to then turn around and reimburse you, then that's as smooth a, pos a, a process as possible. So it's at a government owned property. So the applicant can be private, can be public. If you're at the charters are physically going to be located on government owned property, then they're eligible for up to 80, 100 uh, percent, excuse me, of eligible costs. And if it's a non government owned property, then it's eligible for up to 80 percent of the costs. Now, we did not prescribe, unlike the level two the offering, we did not prescribe a maximum amount per charger. We're just going to look at your project costs again in this case because site prep costs um, are sometimes really high. Um, and uh, so we are just going to look at your overall project cost. What of that is eligible and of the eligible cost? How much are you asking us to contribute? And, and that's what we're going to base it on. I also wanted to point out, and this will come up again in later slides, that uh, we would prefer that a dual port chargers over single port, even though there's not a separate funding amount for each. OK, some key considerations that we always want to remind people of is that a this is a reimbursement grant, meaning you're going to apply. We're going to review applications. If you get selected for funding, we're going to reach out to you. We're going to sign a grant contract with you, but then you're going to go ahead and do the work on your own expense. And then once the work is done and you've correctly, you know, you've collected all the necessary documentation and then you've submitted it to us, we've reviewed it looks good, then we reimburse you. So that's what it's very important to keep in mind that this is a reimbursement grant. It should also be explained to you why we're very, very careful about what we deem eligible and what we don't and why we keep asking our grantees before application, during the application period, please contact us if you have any questions because the worst case scenario for us is not that your project didn't get funded. The worst case scenario is that it got funded uh, but you didn't have the capacity to complete the project or that there was something funded, you know, that was never asked about and clarified that ultimately like we end up for for whatever reason doesn't meet our eligibility criteria. So just please keep that in mind. Uh, please keep el location eligibilities in mind. We'll cover that in a couple of slides further down the road. Uh, it's got to be publicly available. Available 24 seven. Uh, the equipment has to be purchased, can't be leased. It has to be networked. And just like our level two uh, program offering, we require a five year equipment warranty and a five year service contract. And a um, you're going to be on the hook to operate, maintain and report on your charger for five years from the day you initiate operation of the chargers. All right, so program eligibility. Again, there are four eligible eligibility kind of things that you want to pay attention to. Um, your location, um, your, you know, what sites are eligible, what applicants and what costs. So let's kind of like look at that real quick. Again, the 26 counties that many of you have heard many, many times and are now very familiar with. Um, here's sort of something I want to spend a few minutes on. Eligibility wise, we need you. The eligible locations are uh, locations that are within two miles of a highway functional classification road oh, one, two and three. And then later on, I may I'll, hopefully I'll be able to show you what some of those roads look like and, and we also have maps that we can show you. But just kind of keep that in mind that you've got to be within two miles 
of a road that meets this classification one, two or three under the highway functional classification system. And so the closer you are, the other thing is that you can go, you can be as much as two miles away, but obviously someone that's a quarter mile away from this road or a half a mile away from this road will rank higher than someone that is 1.9 miles away. And if you're above two miles, uh, then it's not eligible for funding under our program. I mentioned again that they, this has to be publicly available to any member of the public 24 hours a day without any access restrictions. This comes up sometimes, let's say, say a car dealer that's willing to offer, you know, make it available to public during business hours, but in the, at night, and rightfully so, for security purposes, they have a gate or a fence um, and, and it's not accessible. Unfortunately, unless your charger is outside that fence, it would not be eligible for funding under this program. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we would rank chargers or proposals for locations that are further away from existing publicly available stations will rank higher. There's an Appendix A and an Appendix B in our RFA that um, you should really pay attention to and hopefully we'll take a few minutes and take a look at those to help you determine which locations you should focus on. Okay. Eligible applicants are pretty much the same as our other funding programs. So you can, I'm not going to read the list to you. It's all, it's there and it's in the RFA document as well. The one thing I want to emphasize on the slide is the one, the bullet in the bottom. That is that this time around, we, we learned a difficult lesson with the level two offering where we allowed applicants to submit for multiple locations within the same application. Uh, that became a very difficult scenario uh, in terms of just the completeness of applications, many missing pieces, um, you know, uh, location information not consolidated together and so on. Uh, so we're doing that a little differently here. As an applicant, you're welcome to submit for as many locations as your heart desires, but each location needs to be a separate standalone application. So let me say that again. Each location is a separate standalone application. So that I just wanted to make sure that that point was very, very clear. <clears throat> In terms of costs that are eligible, um, again, just take a look at the list. I would say things that are typically associated with providing electric vehicle charging at a certain location, those uh, are all of those are pretty much covered under the seven items that are listed there that is what is eligible under our program. I would encourage you to take a look at section 3.3 of the RFA again for what is not eligible because there's a there's a long list of things that are not eligible for funding and those are listed there. Program requirements again they're divided into four categories uh, in our RFA document in section four. The requirements for the site, requirements for the equipment, requirements for operating a charging station and then requirements for reporting back to us at different points and we'll cover each of those in like really quickly. So for a project site, many of these things again I've, I've already listed so you can take a look. Um, uh, I'll point out a couple of things like amenities obviously are really, really important. We expect amenities to be within a quarter mile of the site. Um, and then uh, the ADA requirement, one of the other lessons learned from the level two uh, effort is some, we actually have grant recipients uh, that are having, I, for, for whatever reason, ADA compliance seems to be uh, a challenge. And so we are getting some of these projects and their documentation is complete and they've submitted for reimbursement. And one of the things that we see that is missing is meeting the ADA compliance requirement. Uh, so I do want to stress that um, we require that at least one charger and one of the parking spots be ADA compliant so people with disabilities are able to use chargers that we fund. Um, and in as much as we want to work really closely and we want to make this project a very good, positive, smooth experience for you, our applicant, please know that if you don't meet the ADA requirement, we will not reimburse you. We will not reimburse you. And that is something that 
uh, my colleagues and I are dealing with on the level two side of things and we're kind of holding the line. So please pay special attention to that. And there is a graphic in the RFA document that spells out exactly what you need to do. So please make sure that you, your vendor, your contractor, everybody is aware of that and, and, and you plan to meet those requirements from day one. Um, capacity uh, under this RFA, and we'll, we're asking for um, two chargers that can charge a car at 100 kilowatts each. And we're asking for power to add on two more of those chargers down the road. So that's the capacity requirement for a project site that we would fund under this uh, RFA. Um, the RFA document, I will point out to you, it says 120 kilowatts. Uh, that was left in there as an oversight. We're collecting any and every item that we see that we want to tweak. And at some point, we're going to issue an addendum to the RFA and we're going to make that 100. So if you notice the discrepancy between this slide and what's in the RFA, uh, we thought that, uh, you know, uh, setting the capacity at 100 kilowatts would, uh, would allow our applicants a, a slightly broader range of equipment that they can then uh, consider for their projects. On charging, again, I touched upon that. It's 100 kilowatts each, minimum two chargers. You've got to have two, a minimum of two separate chargers that can each charge a car at 100 kilowatts each. And, and that's the minimum requirement. We actually prefer dual port chargers where that one charger can now charge. If, it's, if one car is plugged to it, it gets 100 kilowatts. If two cars are plugged to it, it gets at least 50 kilowatts each. If you propose dual port chargers, uh, again, we didn't set a separate dollar amount for one or the other, but we will rank dual port chargers higher than single port chargers as we do the scoring and ranking of the applicant applications that we receive. The rest of it is pretty um, standard uh, fast charger technical standards. Uh, we have uh, networking requirements. We have an open source communications protocol requirement. All of those things are listed in the RFA document as well. Again, ADA compliant equipment, um, the ability for a user to pay, uh, credit cards and so on. And of course, we mentioned the five-year manufacturer's warranty as well as a five-year service contract. In terms of operating the chargers themselves, again, many of these things tend to kind of lend themselves to, to repeat. Uh, but as you can see, they're um, very standard. Your vendor should be very familiar uh, with these requirements, uh, whoever you work with on these projects. Um, we do have asked that you also, ultimately you're committing to, to registering your new charters that we help fund on the AFDC and PlugShare websites as well. Uh, there are reporting requirements associated with our grant program, um, and there are four. Basically, one is that you submit semi-annual project progress reports. Initially, these reports will be, hey, I got these permits, I don't have those permits, right? Or the second progress report may be that, um, you know, this is the work that's been on the site, the chargers are, going, are expected to arrive, you know, and so on. And then once you get that done and then you have the chargers actually in place up and running, then you submit to us a request for reimbursement and we will review that request for reimbursement. We will withhold 10% of your grant amount and we will reimburse you the rest if everything else checks out. Then a grantee will operate their chargers for a minimum of five years from that date, not five years from today, not five years from when you get the grant, five years from when your charger comes online. We're looking for five annual reports uh, of charger usage oper uh, and operating usage uh, reports. Um, and then at the end of completing five, so in many cases, say you, your charger came on board, you know, came into operation in say July. So you'll be submitting one partial year report and then five full years after that and then once you're done with that you submit a final project completion report and we release the remaining 10 percent so um, the reporting requirements are actually pretty straightforward we also will provide a template uh, for you to fill out and um, those templates have actually been 
you know, vetted by, uh, you know, a number of vendors um, already in the state who operate and, and it's all kind of like pretty standard requirements um, that we have on there. But the information you provide will be very valuable for us as a state to kind of get a good sense of where uh, we're headed, you know, where did we get more usage, where's the growth at and so on that will really help, um, you know, other policymakers in the future make good decisions. In terms of the applications themselves, uh, this is the five part. These are the five parts. Uh, I'll try to walk you through those five parts here um, in a few minutes. Uh, but the thing that I want to stress is that we need all five pieces in your application. So if something's not there, then your application will be incomplete. So number one, please submit a complete application. Please use these templates. We actually try to get you fillable Word documents on our website. So it's easy for you to simply download and fill in uh, and please provide as much information as you can. Sometimes in these projects, some of the things seem a little repetitive. There's a reason why we're asking every question that we're asking. So we ask you to put in the time and effort to answer each question as completely as you can. And we'll walk through the RFA documents and you'll you'll see. I would also want to take a moment and, and tell you that if you are, have any issues during the course of preparing your application, please email us with questions early. Uh, those may be questions that other people have as well. There may be an oversight on our part. We're not perfect. Uh, we just try to do the best we can for our stakeholders in the state. And so please email us as early as, as you can so that we can help sort through whatever it is that you're facing. And then when you're done, Please try not to wait till the last day to submit the application. I know that's human nature, but we also have a huge flurry of things come in on the last day. Um, in an age of technology, systems can be down, uh, networks can get clogged and so on. So I would say to you, whenever you have an application ready and you feel good about it, please by all means go ahead and submit it to us. So now um, the last thing that I, I want to talk about before we take a quick tour of the RFA document is that uh, here are the criteria that we're going to use to list uh, to, to rank and score the applications that we receive. And I pretty much I think I've touched on every one of them, but here they are on one slide. Please pay attention to these as you try to decide which sites you're going to propose. So. If you're in a county that has fewer public non-Tesla stations, the DCFCs, you're likely to get, you're going to get scored higher. And I'll show you a list here in a few minutes that you can take a look at. And so that's a criterion. If you're further away from the next charger, someone who's 20 miles away from the next publicly available charging station is much more likely to get funded than someone who's two miles away, a location that is. Cost effectiveness, as with all programs, uh, we're looking for how many chargers are we going to get in the state for how much grant dollar investment that our office is going to make. So the less, you know, just because you can ask for 100% doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can ask for 80% doesn't mean that you should. Please know that, that your ask impacts your ranking and where you rank in our system. Uh, I already mentioned the functional class one, two, and three. Obviously, you want to get as close to a functional class one road that will rank higher than a location that is proposed that is closer to a functional class two or functional class three roads. Now, if you're in a county that has virtually no charging stations and the best location you can come up with is a functional class three road, somewhere two miles of that, please don't uh, misunderstand me and think I'm discouraging you from applying. No, please apply for the best locations that you can find, but please know that within your county, the closer you are to a higher functional class road, the more likely you are to get funded or the higher you'll score. Uh, amenities, again, we'll take a look. Amenities are a necessity and the closer they are, the better. We expect them to be within a quarter of a mile. We don't expect people to park their car, connect to a charger and have to walk further to just to use a bathroom or grab a bite to eat or something like that. I've talked about dual port chargers being preferred over single port chargers. And then, you know, I mentioned the 100 KW is our expectation. 
So some of you may think, well, I have 150 kW charger that I was going to propose. That's what I want for my location because um, I think that works best. So by all means, the higher capacity charger you propose, the higher that'll rank as well. So that'll be one of the sort of points, if you will, or the scoring criterion that we're going to use. And then the last thing that you see on there is we've required two chargers. We're requiring enough electricity, electric capacity to add two more chargers down the road. But if you come in and say, well, we have capacity for four more chargers or six more chargers, um, then those projects, I mean, we would we would assign priority points to those as well. So there uh, are in that in a nutshell is our review and an overview of our review and ranking process. So with that, I think we're going to take a quick tour of the RFA document. So let me do pull that up. So again, for those of you that have never done this before with us, uh, I just started at the at the you know you can go to Google and you go to Ohio e well there you go Ohio EPA VW settlement. So if you Google that, we literally show up as the first link. That will bring us bring up the page for our office, the Office of Environmental Education within the Ohio EPA. If you scroll down to the middle of the page, you'll see these tabs. These are all the programs that our, our office administers. And the one we're interested in is the VW mitigation grants. Now, if you come there, now this is this is a gold mine of information about the VW program in Ohio. So, you know, if you ever feel inclined, please take a look at this entire page. For what we're talking about today, you would click on the top accordion tab here that says DMTF 2021 RFA for DC fast charging stations. So I'm going to expand that and here's information about that. As you can see, there's links to the webinar today's and the one for, uh, for Tuesday as well. Our email address is there and then the RFA document itself is there. So I'm going to take a th about 30 seconds and walk you through what's over here. The RFA document is here. We had a draft comment period about 10 days when we put the draft document together, put it out. We got some fantastic comments and I want to thank our stakeholders who, who provided those comments to us. Uh, a list of the 26 priority counties and then these four pieces are your fillable documents that, that you would use when you actually uh, uh, develop or when you're kind of compiling your application. So with that, I'm going to right click here and open up the RFA document itself. Um, and then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stop at the um, table of contents page just to show you that, you know, we do indeed put thought into this. Uh, so there is a sort of method to the madness, if you will. Um, so the first section is just the overall information about the RFA. Uh, section two is about general grant requir you know, requirements for most. These are consistent across all of our grant programs. And then you come to these slides where we talk about eligibility, right? And, and you know, is where you want to put this an eligible location? Are you an eligible applicant? And are the costs that you're looking to get funded eligible costs? So I always tell people, please go to eligibility first and make sure that the, you, you kind of check these boxes. And then you come further down and you look at the program requirements. I've already kind of walked you through or most of these program requirements. They're listed in detail here. And I'd encourage you again to, to take a look at all of them. I will stress that about 80% of the questions we get before the application is submitted, the answers to those questions are in this document. So we literally go do a control F and look at it if we need to, and we give you an answer. So it's really worth your while to familiar, familiarize yourself with this document. So I've talked about the program requirements between the site, the equipment, the charging station operations and reporting. And then down here, we talked about the review and the project selection criterion and what pieces of information you need to submit. Now, further down here are the list of appendices, and I want to spend a few minutes here that, that to show you what all is listed there. For example, most of the things I talked about, right? I talked about what roadways are eligible, what counties, what roadways. I'm going to scroll down to that here in a couple of minutes to show you those maps. There, we, 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 you know, we thank uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation for helping us with those maps. We generated our list of the publicly available chargers we're using that as our baseline list. Uh, then there's the templates for filling out the documents. 
And lastly, there's the ADA compliance requirement. We're going to give you guys a look at that as well here. So with that, uh, close your eyes if you will, because I'm going to scroll a couple of uh, pages really fast down to the appendices. OK. So when you start with the first appendix, again, the 26 eligible counties, you can see the markings where there are publicly available DC fast chargers in the state. Um, you can see some clusters, obviously, in Cincinnati, in the Columbus area, and up in the Cleveland area, far fewer chargers in other places and in, in other counties, you can see that. And then what we did was for each county, each of the 26 counties, we created a map. And I just want to explain the map to you real quickly. So, for example, this is Ashtabula County. By our check, there's not a single publicly accessible DC fast charger in Ashtabula County right now. OK, so there may be chargers in a car dealership or something like that that aren't totally publicly accessible and those, those don't show up in the map. I would think that this is a fantastic opportunity for Ashtabula County to get some funding for chargers there. You can see the functional class road. The red is functional class one. That is I-80, as most of you can tell. Then the orange is the functional class two road. And then there may be, there's a yellow functional class three road as well. And then we identified a two mile buffer. So if you're in this green space, then your location is eligible for funding under this application, uh, this, this RFA. So that's, we've, we've tried to kind of make it uh, that clear and that available to you. So as an early determiner of, you know, am I even eligible for this program or not? And we've proceeded to do that for all uh, 26 counties. Here's Butler County. I wanted to point out two other things. Again, the yellow is the county itself. The green portion of the yellow is um, locations that you want to consider for deploying your EV chargers in your county. Then there's this shaded, this, this light gray shade over here. A light gray shade means this is a neighboring county, but it's an eligible county. So it's eligible in our program. So, so neighboring uh, Butler County uh, is this eligible county. And then if it's dark gray, then it's a county that's either ineligible or it's out of state. Um, so you can see Ohio here. So this is the Ohio state line. If you look, so this portion at least we know is Indiana, right? So again, this map is we, we've, we've put in the effort to provide these maps to you to make it as easy as we could for you to identify uh, a potential location for these DC fast chargers. So and then moving on to appendix, the second appendix, this is the list of publicly available non-Tesla chargers. Again, we got this from the Department of Energy's AFDC website. Anyone can go and pull up this list. We found, I think, I believe about 112 publicly available charging stations, and we've listed them all here uh, with their names, their addresses, their networks that they're connected to, and their coordinates. Um, you can see they're shaded. So just so you know, this was just to make it easy on our eyes. So alternate counties are shaded just so you can tell when you go to Allen, from Allen to Athens to Butler to Claremont County and so on. So they're just shaded for that convenience. There's no other significance of the shading beyond that, just to make it easier on our eyes. So here's a list and this is the baseline list that we are going to use. It was a list in time, obviously. And this list may have changed between when we pulled it on October 29 and today. We acknowledge that and we understand that, but we, you have to draw the line somewhere. And we had to draw, we drew that line as closely to opening our RFA as we could. So we, we drew the line Friday before we opened it up on Monday. Here's another sort of quick sample, um, uh, sort of a summary table for you. Here are you know, this list is everybody. This is not just the eligible um, counties. This is all publicly available stations. So theoretically, your location that you're proposing may be far away from another charger in an eligible county, but it may be just a couple of miles away from one in an ineligible county. So you can see there's Wayne County is here, Seneca County, Richland County. These aren't eligible for funding under the VW program but they have some DC fast chargers and you want to keep those in mind. And that's why we listed them there for you to take a look at. Now, coming to our 26 eligible counties, here's a listing based on that table. And then we kind of um, uh, kind of consolidated down to just the 26 
counties eligible for funding. Here's the listing alphabetically of how many publicly available non-Tesla DC fast chargers we found in each county. And here they're re-ranked by how many stations currently exist. So for these, and then the second ranking is just alphabetical. So literally there's no difference between Ashtabula and Ottawa County for these purposes. Uh, so they all have a sum total of zero publicly available non-Tesla chargers at this time. This group has one, this group has two chargers, three, four, and, and so on. So as you can see, we've actually tagged it. So if you're in one of the counties up here, um, you know, the higher you are on this table, the more likely you are to get priority points for funding. Uh, there's also instructions to find the nearest charging station. Um, and so please take a look at that because you'll need that for the application. And then there's the application, kind of the pieces of the application itself. There's the project proposal. It looks a lot like the level two project proposal, uh, but please again, make sure you fill in the right information. Um, this is all about who you are. So there are four roles, um, you know, specified here, who prepared the application, who's the authorizing agent that's gonna sign the contract, who's the fiscal agent that's going to be submitting the reports, and who's the project director, the person, he or she, who from you know day one to day end during the implementation, they're gonna be the ones that we're gonna be talking to, probably submitting the operating operating reports, uh, construction pro you know, progress and so on. Um, and then information about budget information about the project, uh, site specific information. We have requir requirements again for, uh, you know, simple maps and so on of where the site is located. Uh, if you come further down, we need obviously information about the electric utility that you're working with, um, the structure for the site, who's going to own it, who's going to operate it and so on. So we uh, we ask those types of questions. Now here, I mentioned, um, you know, describe your proposed, proposed location relative to other publicly available charging stations. So here's that that's an example of where you would use the information in Appendix B to talk about how close or how far you are to the next available station. There is a requirement to submit an ODOT TIMS map. This is the map that you're going to use, the tool you're going to use to demonstrate to us that you your location is eligible, meaning that it is within two miles of a um, functional class one, two or three road. Not only that, the closer you are to the higher functioning road class, that's how you would demonstrate that to us and that's how you would get a higher score. So please make sure you include this information. A schematic of the parking um, garage or lot itself and, and you know specifically showing the ADA measurements and so on on there. Details on the chargers and so on. All of this goes into this project proposal. There's a, you know, a proposed sort of an estimated schedule, um, you know, permitting and where you are on that calendar. And then um, you know, a signature by the applicant again. And if you remember, I said the authorizing agent on page one is the one who signs this application, and that's the person we expect to also sign the grant contract with our director if your project gets funded. Um, I mentioned the TIMS map and how to generate it. You know, ODOT again was gracious to provide detailed information. It's the same as if you uh, competed for the level two funding. It's the, basically the same guidelines uh, there as well, just updated to um, work for a DCFC proposal uh, for within two miles of a roadway functional class one, two or three um, location. Uh, a project budget template again, the one thing I'll call out here that's different from the level two offering is, you know, you're basically listing the number of single port chargers and the number of dual port chargers. So when you uh, list them here, you simply add these two numbers. You do not double up on the dual port chargers. We're counting a dual port charger as one charger. We're counting a single port charger as one charger. It's just that when we do the ranking, we're going to rank those that choose to deploy dual port chargers higher or assign them priority points at that time. So this is your budget um, table. Uh, there's a certification that most of you who have participated in our programs before uh, you're familiar with. You are and your, uh, your authorizing official is checking these boxes and signing this and saying, I understand I will follow these. So among them is the ADA requirement that I mentioned earlier, 
Among them uh, are require are, is a statement that you will follow any state or local procurement or contracting laws that apply to you and so on. So all the sort of the big ticket items, if you will, that's in the certification. And finally, we also generated um, for your convenience and ours, a eligibility and a completeness checklist. I would advise you to start here. I would advise you to start figuring out your eligibility first. Are you in an eligible county? Are you within two miles of a functional class one, two or three roadway? Uh, and is the site that you're proposing going to be available 24 seven? I would just start at that point and then um, as you prepare the application, just make sure that everything that is required here is a yes um, before you submit it, including the financial ca capability documentation that we need for non-government applicants only. Uh, and then of course your application preparer signs this. So this also I would ask that you put this on top of your PDF. If you email us one single PDF, just make sure that's up top or at the bottom somewhere where we can find that real easily. Because when we do our review, we will start with the completeness checklist as well. The last thing in the RFA again is the uh, ADA compliance requirement. Um, the last time we got a lot of questions on the level two RFA. So this time we wanted to make it simple but clear. So here it is quite simply and quite clearly what we expect you to, to put. Uh, one of these parking spaces that you're going to be using on your site, just one out of no matter how many, actually it says here 25, uh, but we've never um, gotten a request for that many, but at least one of them has to meet this, uh, these uh, measurements, this spacing requirement, this aisle requirement, and then there's also the height requirement for the equipment itself. So uh, please pay attention to these requirements. Make sure, you, you know, we talk to our vendors a lot. We have some fantastic EV charging vendors in the, and consultants in the state. They know the stuff. Please make sure as an applicant that um, you, that this is built into your planning uh, process. So with that, I'm going to switch back to just a quick recap, uh, I would say to you, uh, again, I've said it a few times, but it, it, you, if you want to make the most of your time and energy invested and try to get funded, number one, confirm your eligibility. Number two, look at the citing criteria that we mentioned to you and try to focus your efforts on those appropriate locations. Number three, I would say, please start working together, you, you know, as a, whoever you are as an applicant, but with the site host, uh, a vendor potentially or more or the, the local utility and the local government organization that um, and just make sure everybody's on board because obviously for DC fast chargers, the power requirements are higher than for level two charging. There may there may be other elements and, and doing a DC fast charging project takes more. So start early working on that. And the last thing is just please submit a complete and detailed application don't leave anything to chance, don't leave anything blank, uh, don't assume anything that you're not 100% certain about, please email me, email Ryan or anyone in our office and we'll be happy to get that information to you. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we view this program, for us success is not making $7 million in grants or getting 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 applications. That's not how we view success. For us, and, and this program is not us sitting on a pot of money saying, if you jump high enough, we'll give you some of that money. This is our view is that this program is a partnership between Ohio EPA, our communities, our businesses, our vendors, our contractors, our municipal planning organizations, our clean city coalition organizations, actually all of us working together so we can actually put these DC fast chargers in Ohio in a way that serves current EV owners, but also encourages other people who currently do not own electric vehicles to consider getting an electric vehicle. And eventually this in turn will get us all cleaner air in Ohio. So we can do this, but we can do this. Yeah, I mean, I know we're limited to 26 counties. I get that question a lot. Why not, you know, why not my county? Why not my county? The program limits us to 26 counties, but even within these 26 counties, we can take a huge step towards that, towards you know, increasing the footprint of EV charging infrastructure in Ohio, 
there are other funding programs, there's other funds that, that are being talked about in Washington, D.C. that will probably come through state DOTs, that will probably come through our municipal planning organizations that can plug the other gaps in the other counties. And so we're anticipating much more funding. We're focusing ours within the VW program in these counties, but we can only do it if we get as many as possible solid, well thought, well articulated, cost effective applications that we are happy to fund. So please don't hesitate to ask questions, explain your challenges to us early and often during the application period. And, um, you know, I always say email is always better than a phone call. We will respond. We do respond to every single email that we get, and we do try to help our applicants in every way that we can. Finally, again, just before I start to take questions, we'll do a second webinar. We'll post this information on our web page for you to come back and take a look at and review. So please keep an eye on our web page as well. And uh, please save our email address that we use to email or inform our stakeholders. Please make sure that that's on your safe list and add it to your contacts. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions that may be out there. Uh, first, uh, first question, question, is an applicant able to participate if currently uh, having another gr VW grant? Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> I was actually taking a quick sip of water, so thank you for that. Um, we, um, yes, the short answer is yes. You, even if you have a level two grant with us, you're able to apply for DC fast charging grants. We do, however, like let's just say if all things being equal or close to being equal, we reserve the right to fund uh, a grantee who has fewer grant applications or not, who does not currently have a grant with us. Uh, I will underscore one point that if you are a current grantee, either on the vehicle side or the EV charging side, and you don't have a very good track record of implementing your grant uh, after we've awarded it, then that is also something that we take into account and uh, we're not likely to fund someone that had trouble actually completing a project um, the last time we funded them. Thank you, Lund. Uh, can you comment on the pending federal legislation on quote unquote all things EV? In Ohio, <laughs> will there be a coordinated effort to deploy future funding and how will this current EW program fit in and transition? So here's my comment on the federal funding that that is is that we're super excited about it. I am uh, super excited about it. Seven point five billion dollars for EV char charging funding is is um, clearly unprecedented. So these are exciting times for people who are interested in seeing uh, EV charging infrastructure deployed. Having said that, that funding we anticipate will, will most likely go through state departments of transportation and municipal planning organizations. We don't think that that's going to come our way. We already have a strong working relationship with ODOT and with our MPOs. They're fantastic partners for us here. And so um, we uh, we look forward to just kind of working with them and seeing, you know, and, and helping them deploy this funding in as uh, most, you know, diligent and efficient way possible to best help the state. But the ball is largely in their court and we will just try our best to support them as best as we can. Thank you. Is there an expected or typical ownership structure for DCFC stations under this program, such as locally owned and operated and network supported versus network owned, operated and maintained with the locals only providing the site itself? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, we again realize that different things work better in different situations depending on um, the location, uh, depending on how engaged the site host is. So we always um, lean towards uh, providing our applicants with the greatest amount of flexibility to come up with uh, a, a project proposal that works best for them and for our, our ultimately for our charging station users. Um, you know, there clearly are some distinctions, for example, that if you are if if uh, you are a city or a village and you're applying and you're an applicant, you don't have to provide a site host agreement if that you're putting it on your own land. Uh, if you are a public entity, then you don't have the financial capacity requirements that a private applicant has to meet. So there are some distinctions in that case, but uh, to the questioner's question, no, we're not. Um, we're not advocating one over another. We're leaving that totally up to 
um, our 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 stakeholders here in Ohio. Thank you. So there's a question about um, the requirement in, in Section 4.2 about mm -hmm. the ability of chargers to provide a greater um, power output um, that will rank higher in our review process. There is a charger that offers 62.5 kilowatts, but can be installed in paired configuration to allow two vehicles to charge at the same time and share power based on the demand. So if only one vehicle is charging at the stations that are paired, the charger in use offers 125 kilowatts. Would that permit the charge point that the particular equipment to satisfy the program's requirement? Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. As long as the paired charger, and I'm familiar with the charger in question, as long as the paired configuration operates as a charger unit, right? And I'm happy to talk to the questioner offline if, if we want to discuss this more or even for that company in particular, their vendors, um, if they want to have this conversation. But the general answer is yes. If you've got two of these chargers that are paired, uh, but they each like kind of each charger operates as a single unit, which is my understanding, then uh, that would be that would be eligible. Thank you. Uh, the next question um, basically asks like when will grant award decisions be made and when will the funds be available? Ah, uh, good question. So on my presentation, I listed the end of April. So we have until you have until the end of January to submit an application. We give ourselves three months to uh, do all the reviews, get everything uh, lined up, um, reviewed, uh, ranked, listed and so on. So we've given ourselves three months. Um, our past experience with level two uh, has taught me uh, to put a lot of disclaimers to those deadlines, to those timelines, because a lot of it again is totally driven by two things. A, the number of applications that we get and B, uh, the quality of the applications that we get as we try to work with our applicants uh, to get it done. So April end is what I'm shooting for. Uh, because we already will have been in the, having done one round of funding with the uh, level two grants, we also do not expect uh, the time lag that we had this time for funding being available for reimbursement from the trustee as well. So um, April 30, April 30th is what we're working with, but please be prepared that it may you know go beyond that as well. Thank you. The person who asked this next question uh, isn't located in the 26 eligible counties. The person's wondering if they're still eligible to apply um, and if we'll consider their application regardless. Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, we will not be able to consider any location that's not within the 26 eligible counties. Um, I, we understand and we totally respect the fact that there are so many Ohioans um, in outside of these 26 counties that would like to deploy charges and could certainly benefit from sort of some grant funding. That's why we're so excited also about the federal funding that's making its way hopefully down and a share of that coming to the state of Ohio and hopefully they can get funded. Uh, just as a reminder, this EV charging offering is a small piece of the much bigger Volkswagen settlement funding here in Ohio. So it's part of the same plan and that overarching plan for the entire 75 million, that's where the 26 county limitation is at that point. So those those were determined based on specific criterion, and that's sort of what we're sticking to as we deploy or we implement the VW program uh, in Ohio. So it's not something, a decision that we make specifically for EV charging. I just wanted to point that out as well. Having said that again, um, Thank you for joining the webinar and for your interest, and we really truly hope that um, you are able to get some of that funding. I would also encourage you, depending on wherever you are, please call your electric utility. Uh, there are certain utilities in uh, Ohio that are helping or at least in a position to help with some of the funding. Please call your municipal planning organization, whichever MPO covers your area. They're often best plugged in to funding opportunities locally and regionally as well. And then keep your eye out for the federal funding that's coming our way. And hopefully you can get some funding uh, through uh, that avenue. Thank you. As a follow up to that 26 eligible counties question, someone asked about 
the delineation between the first and second priority counties and why there is that delineation? Uh, that seems to be a really popular <laughs> question these days. Again, uh, the priority counties were actually based on um, uh, four criterion, if I remember correctly. I'm going off my memory because it's been a few years now. And it was, first of all, it was based on air quality factors, uh, non-attainment areas for ozone, um, which is, uh, you know, precursor, uh, NOx is a precursor for that. And so uh, which counties were more impacted by these defaulting Volkswagen? Remember I mentioned 16,000 Volkswagens in Ohio or Volkswagen Audis and Porsches in Ohio that were the violating vehicles. So it was determined by factors like that, like, you know, who's got non-attainment issues, number one. Where were most of these Volkswagen, these uh, Volkswagen cars registered and located, number two? Historically, who's had um, the greatest burden of, um, you know, most adversely impacted by air quality issues in the state. So there were three or four criteria that are used. Those are actually in our VW plan uh, that's on our website for anyone to go ahead and take a look at that, take a look at the plan. So that's number one. And the first and second priority counties that the, uh, the questioner was asking about is, um, to put it quite, quite frankly, that's in the VW plan. That's the map that we continue to use. But for purposes of this program, they're not first and second priority. We might as well have put no shading and no delineation between the two for EV charging purposes. But when it comes, when we also have another side of this program where we fund uh, specific vehicles, like we replace, uh, for example, old diesel locomotives with new all electric ones and so on, then if it, depending on how competitive a certain grant round is, a first and second priority county, uh, there that's one of the ranking criteria. So again, don't worry about it for EV charging. Just focus on the 26 counties. There's not a distinction between the first and second. As a matter of fact, most of the second priority counties are actually the more rural counties, if you will, with fewer DC fast chargers. So if you go to a second priority county, you're li actually more likely to get funded. Uh, you are likely to at least get scored higher in our funding um, and ranking process. Thank you. Uh, would an academic institution that receives government funding be considered a government owned property? Um, depending on, I mean, uh, private schools get public funding. <laughs> And um, so and public schools get some private funding as well. So I would say it's it, it just simply depends on whether you're a private or a public academic institution and you know which one you are. Thank and by you. the way, both are eligible. I'm sorry, Ryan, just to add to that, okay. both are eligible to participate in the grant program. The question is simply whether you're eligible for 100% or 80%. So please, by all means, if you've got a good location, and you're an educational institution and you think you'd be a good location for a DC fast charger, uh, by no means, please don't take that as discouragement from applying. Please apply. It's just um, some of the government versus non-government, uh, uh, you know, nuances that I'd mentioned earlier about financial capacity demonstration, about site hosts and, th and things like that. That's, all, you know, those are the distinctions, but you're uh, eligible to apply in both cases. Yes, those are important distinctions to note when doing the application. Uh, so the next question uh, asks about um, utilities nearby the locations of the chargers. Like, do the chargers need to be close to like food, bathrooms, and other services, or is uh, only cons consideration really gas stations and convenience stores, or anything in particular they need to be close to? Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, that's a really good question actually. So we were sort of um when we say amenities we obviously food bathrooms uh things like that are is what we have in mind we do also keep in mind that most gas stations now have some you know they have restroom facilities they have uh also some type of food or snack kind of services as well associated with them so um so generally i mean we we've intentionally not put a fine point on what level of amenities, like this is what needs to be there, how many restaurants and so on, because we wanted to afford our applicants with the greatest amount of flexibility, especially if we're also prioritizing you going to a more remote location where there's not a charger close by to it. So we understand that locating one there while plugging a gap is really, really important. So we, so, uh, we have not been very prescriptive about 
exactly what amenities need to be there. But having said that, yes, we do expect there to be bathrooms. We do expect somebody to be able to get a bite to eat, you know, and, and someplace safe that is well lit. Um, all of those things are part of the expectations of amenities within a quarter of a mile. Uh, the greater the level of amenities uh, for that ranking criterion, the higher you're going to rank. So obviously if you're at an outlet mall or something like that where there's a ton of things, uh, then all other things being equal, something like that would obviously rank higher based on your amenities as well. Thank you. Uh, if an applicant is a, awarded a grant, is there a requirement for how soon the charging stations need to be installed? Yes, so typically what we do for these, we allow you 24 months to uh, deploy the charging stations and have them up and running. Uh, we, um, many in many cases, people tell us that's way too generous, uh, but we understand that there are a lot of local considerations that may apply. We also understand that there are a lot of backup right now in equipment supplies and so on just everybody you know all of you out there know that that's that's happening right now so 24 months is going to be the standard uh in your grant contract and i'll also mention that on a case-by-case -case, uh basis uh we all have actually we're actually open to extending that even beyond 24 months by a few months uh if need be on a very case-by-case -case basis but uh, the uh when you're applying, what the, the timeline you should operate under is um, 24 months to install and uh, get the chargers operating, and then five more years, five full calendar years and whatever partial year to actually run those chargers at that location and submit reports to us. Thank you. Um, what type of customer service is required uh, with support for the chargers? And uh, is that someone available by phone or something? more detailed? Yes, so uh, that uh, requirement is actually in section 4.3 of uh, the RFA, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. And But in, in short, it is what you just said. It is uh, not so much the charter isn't working at all, so how do you fix it? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about users pulling up to a charger and having trouble uh, actually getting to use it or figuring out how to use that particular charger, there needs to be a phone number on there that they can call and get help in actually making use of that charger. Thank you. Um, if a business wants to apply for a grant for a charging station on their premises, um, then this is not considered uh, publicly available. Uh, this person is trying to understand the, the public availability requirement a little more. Sure, um, that's a that's a really fair question. So let me say that, um, and I'll extend it out a little bit more than just the business, but like what's not eligible under our program is uh, if a, say a company has its own dedicated parking lot, a uh, business does, and that's where their employees park and so on, that would, or even their visitors or guests would park, and that is not eligible for funding, we, we're not doing office uh, workplace charging. We're not doing multi-unit dwelling, which is where chargers are restricted to uh, tenants of a particular building or even for their visitors only. Uh, what we are doing is um, if you've got a business and you share your parking lot with many other businesses, uh, again, think of a shopping center, think of something like that, a mall, a commercial location, where any member of the public can pull up and connect their car and charge. And you cannot limit that availability just to your customers, just to your visitors, um, just to your employees. Uh, anywhere where it's totally publicly available to people 24 seven, then uh, that is a location that would be eligible. So, and by the way, I would before Ryan, before you move on, for the person asking this question, please uh, feel free to, if you've got a specific business in mind, please shoot us an email specific to your business and, and we're happy to answer that question for you. So even for the level two grant offering where we made grants available to, you know, some medical facilities, for example, uh, that were clinics, uh, they provide they provided a community service, there wasn't a restriction. It was it was not a not a big hospital or something that has a garage, but just a parking lot of some medical facilities. We really stress to our grantees that you cannot limit accessibility to those chargers 
uh, or you can't limit it just to you know people uh, that that uh, patronize your business. Thank you. Uh, the next person uh, was is new to to this process and was wondering about the having a, the scope set for the for a project, having the charging station. Uh, the plans ready for the charging station first, locations picked out, and vendor on the contract. Having all that set before applying, or uh, and if, yeah, everything needs to be constructed first. All the plans set before applying. Well, first of all, welcome. Um, we do these webinars specifically for folks like the person asking this question who are new to this entire program. Um, so, so we're glad you're here with us. Um, so, to answer your question you need to have first the first thing i would do is figure out what location like where you're at right and then go through the eligibility list and make sure that the location that you have in mind or that you're at that you'd like to deploy these charges in, is in an eligible location now once you have an eligible location what you would do then is look at the pieces of the application and what information is required for you to apply um, we think that we've produced these uh, the application and the instructions that we provide through ODOT for generating these maps and so on. We think that they're pretty straightforward to where most people can actually generate that um, themselves. A, a business manager, for example, at a certain business or something like that can probably generate most of those things themselves. Now, not in all cases, but generally. We definitely do not expect you to generate engineering drawings as part of the application process. Please don't incur that app, that cost um, because you know you may not get grant funded. So we don't want you to do that. So yeah. So first thing is think of location or locations. Uh, look for whether those locations are eligible. Uh, then um, start to put together your application. Reach out to vendors who can sell you that equipment or Say there are turnkey vendors out there that will not only provide you the equipment, but they'll also deploy the equipment for you, do the site work and all of that for you. I would encourage you to reach out to many of them and ask them to you know, just list your location and say, it's this parking lot in this city, in this town at this address. What would you put in there and, 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 and how much would you, what, what would that cost to actually kind of get something from them? The good ones will actually come out to your site and meet you and take a look. Um, and uh, you know, then probably possibly give you uh, a quote. Um, and so you would include that quote and as much information as possible in your application. Uh, we'll then review your application. We'll rank it against everybody else. And if we select your application for funding, we will uh, let you know. We'll reach out and sign a grant contract with you. And at that point, you go ahead and actually implement your project and whatever needs to be done with that, like permits and so on associated with that, um, you go ahead and do that. Once you uh, deploy the chargers and you pay your vendors, so they'll invoice you, you'll turn around, pay them back, and you have proof of payment, then after the charger is deployed and you've paid your vendors and you have proof of payment, you'll submit all of that to us and we will reimburse you the amount of uh, like of the uh, the grant amount that we had committed to you. So the grant announcement basically is just us setting aside those dollars for you to be reimbursed when all of this is done. Thank you. Um, are there vendors who are familiar with the application process that will be recommended? Um, good question. Um, you know, the state of Ohio or certainly the Ohio EPA does not recommend particular vendors. I can tell you that there's a there's a number of vendors that participated. There are a number of vendors on the if you're a public entity, there are a number of vendors or for that matter, private entity. Uh, there are a number of vendors under state contract to provide uh, EV services. Most of them, if not all of them, are familiar with our RFA and our RFA process. There are other vendors that have been uh, pretty successful when we did the funding last year for level two grants. Uh, you can reach out to them as well. So we won't recommend anybody, uh, but uh, you can take a, a look at those 
excuse me, you can take a look at those and identify. Uh, my only strong recommendation is don't go with the first one or the only one. Uh, please try to get like contact multiple vendors and uh, um, just kind of get a good feel for for who it would be the best to work with, get some preliminary costs and so on associated with that. But um, we we we're not in the business of recommending a specific vendor. And by the way, if a vendor has never heard of our program uh, in Ohio, then that probably is a strong indicator <laughs> of, of maybe not wanting to go with them uh, because again, we've done a ton of outreach and spoken of conferences where all these vendors come and uh, we've certainly tried to do our part to get the word out. So whether or not they've had success getting funded, um, that's a completely separate question than whether they're even aware of, of our of VW um, EV charging deployment program. Thank you. When submitting the budget, do quotes and from subcontractors and vendors need to also be submitted as part of the application? Absolutely, yes. So you you when you complete your budget template, as I mentioned earlier, um, and I'm going to flip down to that page again. Each item, like I mentioned, from item one to nine, needs to be its own quote or needs to be part of another quote that's included. So that's one of your sort of completeness item. Everyone here, we and then nine is the catch-all other eligible costs. So some things may not be as clear or apparent in items one through eight. Please feel free to list them as item nine and include quotes for them as well. Thank you. Um, this particular location has restrooms available, but only during business hours and for other amenities, people would need to drive into the community. Does that affect the eligibility of this location? Uh, I would say yes, it will affect the eligibility of this location, and, but I would also encourage you to email us offline um, so, so that we can kind of, you know, we can give you a good answer. We can like literally look at your specific circumstances and see whether the, we would deem that eligible or not. From a ranking standpoint, certainly that would that would also have an impact. Also, please remember that we're trying to make these, you know, just imagine someone traveling 11 o'clock at night in winter in Ohio and needs to get home and uh, has uh, needs to pull off for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes for that matter to 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 get a quick charge. Uh, that's hence the focus on amenities and the 24 seven accessibility. So again, I would encourage you to just shoot us an email and we'll respond specifically for the, the situation that you're describing. Thank you. Uh, can, can an applicant or an entity submit a, or um, put a, a level three charger next to a level two charger? Yes, I mean we're we're not we're not going to dictate to you where you can put one. Um, so maybe the more specific question is, when we measure how far you are from the next publicly available DC fast charger, we're not tracking the level two chargers there. So if anything, locating it next to an existing level two charger may be a good thing in terms of the visibility of your charging station location. Uh, can this grant be combined with other utility programs? Um, the short answer again is yes. We're not we're not limiting it to um, you know uh, funding sources. So if you've got another grant or a rebate program, um, we're sort of neutral to that um, uh, in terms of um, yeah. So the short answer is uh, you can combine it with other funding programs. Yes. Uh, I'm just a little aware of time. Uh, Loudon, do you, how many more questions do you want to answer? We have. I, I oh, we we can more. keep going. I think that what will happen. I, I'm seeing 12:24. We're scheduled till 12:30, but at 12:30, people can drop off if they want. I this is there's nothing going on today that's more important than what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to stay on and take at least till 12:30. We can take questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, is there a list of approved vendors? Uh, no, we don't provide a list of approved vendors. Uh, we don't qualify them. Uh, but having said that, uh, the DAS MAC multiple award contract that I've referenced multiple times today 
um, and that their that contact information for them is listed in the RFA document itself. I think there are seven vendors out there. I know that DAS did some vetting and certainly went through the public procurement processes uh, for those. So that may be a good starting point, but um, by no means am I saying you should limit yourself just to them because a number of vendors entered Ohio and started doing a good job in Ohio even after that work was done. We don't have a list, uh, but that may be a good place for you to start. Thank you. Um, this person is curious about um, uh, about commenting on EV deployment in commercial setting. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing new fuel stations popping up around central Ohio, uh, co-locating co all types of vehicles around existing infrastructure and amenities with highway access. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a good point, and I think that those are sort of, I can think of them being sort of a, a more efficient use of, of funding, um, no matter who the funding is from, so that's great. Uh, from our perspective, again, I mean, the criterion for how we will rank someone is uh, pretty clear in the RFA document, and that's sort of what we're going to stick with. So. If the question is, does somebody get scored higher if they're next to other types of uh, alternative fuel um, uh, fueling stations and so on, um, uh, that's not one of the criterion that we have. Although we think, I think, that probably would make the project overall more cost effective and therefore maybe the application could be more cost effective if there's a lot of shared uh, construction costs and so on. So well, hopefully we'll, we'll look forward to seeing those as well. Thank you. Um, OKI Regional Council of Governments has an EV charging station locator map, but do you see fast charger priority areas mapped? Does Ohio EPA take these priority areas into consideration? Um, I think the short answer is when you look at the RFA, the answer is no, because um, they, uh, again, OKI is a fantastic MPO uh, and, a, and a great partner to us. Um, and we kind of work with each other to sort of get the word out on what's available. But um, yeah, but the short answer is we generated our own map based on what was publicly available through public sources so that anybody out there can do that. Our focus is statewide more than it is regional. I can tell you NOACA has a similar map for their uh, for their area. Um, but um, uh, and, and we also work closely, by the way, with them. So even we anticipate that down the road um, they'll be getting their funding a little later maybe uh, but we look forward to kind of sharing any information that we have or they have in terms of um, funding in a way that is sort of cost effective for the state uh, do these i guess do the stations need credit card readers um, again, the, the payment protocols are listed uh, in the document itself, so I'd encourage you to, to, to take a look at those. Yes, should they have the ability to, to take credit cards? Uh, the answer is yes. So again, but the, but the specific requirement is actually listed in um, section uh, 4.3, so I'd encourage you to take a look. There's a specific paragraph about what um, the point of sale requirements are going to be. Thank you. Uh, does the location of a charger have to be two miles from an exit ramp of a major highway or just two miles from the physical highway itself? <laughs> Thank you. That's a really good question. No, it has, it's got to be a two mile drive from the from the highway. So from the exit, yes. Um, again, we're, we're hoping that people have to drive no more than two miles from where they're at, um, at on a highway to get to the charger. Good question, though. Thank you. Um, do we have time for one more, Aloudin? Um, sure, I'll take one more. OK, uh, if a park has a motor vehicle permit cost to drive into the park, is that location eligible? If our park has a, can you read that one more time? Sure. If um, a park has a motor vehicle permit cost to drive mm -hmm. into the park, is that location eligible? 
Yeah, yeah. So just like a public parking garage, like there are garages that charge to park there and there are garages that don't charge to park. We don't, both are eligible. So uh, that the fact that you charge someone to enter the park, as long as anyone in Ohio can enter the park and pay the same fee, uh, that's OK. I think as a park, your bigger challenge will be accessibility, which is 24 seven. So we think that that may be the, the bar, so to speak, that you've got to overcome. Uh, but to answer your question, no, as long as any member of the public uh, has the equal access to get into that park, um, it's OK that you charge for that access. Thank you, Aladdin. Thank you, Aladdin. That was a, oh, good, was a good presentation. Good job. Um, so our first question, um, charger dispenser with both CCS and CHADMO, is this considered a dual port charger, understanding only once one port can be used at a time? Yeah, thank you, Ryan. That's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I'm going to pull the RFA document back up that actually and show you where we've answered that question. But as I do that, the short answer is the a charger with one CC. First of all, OK, let me ask answer a more broad question for what we have required. Different states have required different connectors on the chargers right? that they funded. What we have required is that for one charging location, one plug needs to be CHADMO. All the others can be CCS. So if you're going to put a minimum of two chargers, you don't those both those chargers don't have to have a CHADMO plug. One of them does. So again, rather than one plug CHADMO plug per charger, it's just one per site, one per location. Whether you put two chargers there or you put 20 chargers there, one needs to be CHADMO. And so when we talk about the plugs, those are considered a single port. So if you have a charger that has one CHADMO plug and one CCS plug, that's a single port charger. When I say dual port chargers, I mean chargers that can charge, to, because in that case, you can still only charge one car at a time, right? So when I say dual port chargers, it means you can charge two cars at a time at 50 kW each. Can reimbursement be made partially or only 100% upon completion? Great. Um, yeah, another good question. Uh, we've typically made reimbursements at the end. When I say at the end, when the chargers have been deployed and they are in operation and you know we get to send one of our uh, team members out there to take a look at it, pull it up on their app and make sure that it's up and running and we have all the documentation that we need. Excuse me. Um, but in some cases, if you're an applicant that is applying to multiple locations, eight, nine, five, six, seven, eight, nine locations, obviously that puts a financial uh, sort of burden uh, that is uh, not typical of a single location for one or two chargers, then we would be happy to talk to you about that particular situation and whether we can make uh, reimbursements on some other milestone uh, to help to help you get the project done. There's also that 90% that, um, that we reimburse. We withhold that 10% until um, all the reporting is done. If sure. I remember that correctly. That's correct. So what, what we do is we will withhold 10% until after the five years, five full years of reporting. And so in most cases, it'll be people will submit six reports. Uh, but uh, until the, that in, uh, that uh, five four years of reporting is done and a closing report is submitted, but I believe the the person who asked the question was thinking like, what if I'm putting so many, you know, what if I've applied for and been selected for grants for many chargers? If it's 100% reimbursement, even like as I purchase the chargers, I'm purchasing so many, like the cash outlay up front is significantly higher. Would we consider? Um, some kind of prorated sort of reimbursement uh, on based on certain milestones. And and, I, and my response is we would look at that on a case by case basis. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Uh, next question, any prioritization among roadway classification? Uh, for example, closer to one would rank higher than a, a class three roadway. Yes, that is the, the answer is yes. Thank you for asking the question. Closer to one would rank higher than closer to three. 
But again, we are going to balance that out also, just so you know, that you may be in a county where there's only one, you know, um, uh, function class one roadway, right? And so we're also going to try to balance that out um, with whether there's there are there's other charging infrastructure available in that county and, and what's the outlay generally. So we're going to back. But yeah, within the same county, two eco applications, they're almost the same in every other way. One's two miles of a, road, uh, a functional class one road, one's two miles of a functional class three road. Definitely the functional class one road will rank higher. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question, we have a parking lot in the heart of Granville's downtown as part of our new Performing Arts Center where we do a lot of events. The light is a lot is lighted and open 24 seven. We don't restrict who parks in the slot. Would that be considered publicly available? We put in conduit when we put the light in for just such an opportunity. Nice. Um, it sounds like again, we 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 take a closer look at it and we can maybe talk offline, but just from what you know, the questioner has listed. It sounds like it would absolutely be eligible for funding. Uh, so it's publicly available, open 24 seven, lighted. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the answer is yes, we would uh, consider that publicly available. Uh, thank you. Next question. Uh, it's kind of a more of a comment using Appendix B step by step guide appears there are missing a step that it shows the need to select charger type level two in DC. Uh, would it be er erroneous to list proximity to nearest public charger if it's a level two, or would it be uh, a mistake to list proximity to nearest public DCFC if it's less than 49 kilowatts of power? Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good. I mean, whoever posted that, thank you so much for doing that. So we'll go back and take a look at it. Absolutely, uh, a level two charger would not be considered part of these considerations. We, we were looking at specifically as, at publicly available DC fast chargers because again, in our minds, we're trying to address a different need, which is travel, um, get off the road, charge and be back on and, and, and be on your way. So uh, definitely um, the answer is no, we're, we're comparing against publicly available DC fast chargers. Even if the graphics show uh, level two may be pointed out in the instructions, but if you look at the table in Appendix B, they should be DC fast chargers only. Uh, the second thing is that we did not make a distinction for less than 50 kW. Um, um, so if it's a DC fast charger, it's a DC fast charger. We've included that. But you've given us food for thought whether we need to kind of relook at that. And if something's as low as 24 kW, should we eliminate that from the table as uh, as part of our baseline consideration? But thank you. You've given us something to think about. Thank you. Next question. Do you expect to expand the grant program to more rural counties? Um, you know, I, I get that question a lot and and we think that there should, you know, I think we think that funding should be available to more rural counties because uh, when you travel, you travel, you travel through urban and rural counties. And as we support EV adoption, we, you know, we we want to support it statewide. Now, having said that, the, the reason we, you know, uh, and sometimes, you know, people may not have the full picture, the Volkswagen settlement is primarily an air quality mitigation settlement. So they cheated, they got caught, their cars emitted a lot more pollutants, and then they were, you know, this program was set up to help mitigate that. So there are actually 10 eligible mitigation actions, like part of these funds are going to replace the locomotives, for example, tugboats, uh, school buses, and transit buses, and so on. And so the EV charging is one of 10 or one of nine eligible mitigation actions and that's what and it's part of that larger VW program and that's how we are sort of limited to the 26 counties under Ohio's plan. Uh, um, we are really looking forward to more federal funding coming to states, uh, possibly through um, the Ohio Department of Transportation, through municipal planning organizations. We know they've already gotten some more funding and I think that that funding will be more likely tied to, you know, EV corridors um, and not be and be far more widely accessible than, than 26 counties. 
So we hope that this money makes its way to some of the rural counties. But as far as implementing the VW program, at this point, it's specifically those 26 counties. Thank you. Um, next question on the budget worksheet. Where would you put uh, cost for utility equipment and interconnect costs? Uh, cost, let me go to the budget worksheet and see what the question is. Sorry, it's a big document, 112 pages, so um, we appreciate everybody's patience unless I've passed it. Here's the budget. So can you read that question to me again? Sure. On the budget worksheet, where could you include the cost for utility equipment and interconnect costs? Yeah, so um, I you can put it down under other eligible costs on that. If there's not a clear category in the table that works for it, then feel free to list that. Um, and please, the one other thing I'll take the opportunity to attach, to add on is that we need um, uh, an actual quote to be submitted for this. Uh, so for every item that you list on here, it's 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 specified there, but we I didn't say it during the narrative portion that for every item that you see on there, please include a quote that covers that item, one or more quotes depending on the nature of the work that that includes it. We actually we base our numbers on actual quotes that you submit. Thank you. Next question, would funding uh, be available for companies who are looking for DCFC strictly for city owned vehicles? Um, as part of our program, we are not uh, providing funding for charging stations for fleets whether those are um, city fleets or whether they are private company fleets. Um, you know, just like we said, we weren't going to put charging stations in apartment complexes that would be, you know, limited just to people who live there. Uh, we're trying to make these funds available for chargers that are available to anyone and everyone. And so the short answer is no, it wouldn't. We wouldn't be funding fleet charging uh, with this at this time. Thank you. Uh, has Ohio EPA considered a standardized site verification form for property owners to sign off on? Um, this random assortment of letters, you saw this as a template requirement in California and Texas signed by both applicant and parcel owner. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, again, you, it's uh, something for us to think about. We uh, in the Midwest uh, tend to not uh, dictate anything beyond what is absolutely necessary and leave it open. Dif sites are different and site hosts and, and vendors are different. And uh, so we have not been that prescriptive about a template, but certainly we appreciate the comment and it's something that we can look into. Um, and if we can come up with one, we'll post it on our website and let everybody know that they can use that. Now, having said that, I appreciate you calling attention to the fact that that letter is an important part of the application. Um, that, that, and, and naturally so, you're investing significant amounts of time and energy. You would be working closely with the site host and we would just want that letter. We actually, there are other states that actually require a signed site hosting agreement at the time of application. Uh, we thought that for our applicants that would be a bit much, particularly if you don't know whether you're actually getting funded or not. So we're just going to go with a commitment letter with the application and then down the road, once you actually receive the grant and you're putting in the chargers, before we reimburse you, we will ask for an actual site host agreement at that time now. Um, but again, food for thought whether we should come up with some template that to make available to our applicants to standardize that will certainly take a look. Uh, if you've got templates, you mentioned a couple of states. Um, if you've got specific templates that you want to share with us, please feel free to email us as well. Thank you. Next question. Do all of the DCSC stations awarded in the Ohio DAS contract meet the program requirements? 
You know, that's a good question, and and and, and that comes up from time to time. I am reluctant to to, to say yes. Um, I wouldn't. I would leave that up to folks because some of that that it's been a couple of years. And we have to remember that that wasn't set up specifically for VW funding. That was a service that DAS undertook for all public entities in Ohio to use with any sort of funding. So um, the I guess the honest answer to that is I don't know because I we haven't gone back and take a look, a look at each one and compared them against our specs. But certainly I can tell you that the seven vendors that are listed there uh, they're all active participants in our funding programs, and it should be a pretty straightforward answer if you were to contact any one of them. Thank you. Um, next question, does dual port mean two ports and two separate charging sessions, shared power, or two port, one session only? An example is Electri Electrify America. Yes, so let me go back to the visual. And and again, I mean, I know we've kind of answered this question before, but I, you know, I appreciate someone asking it again because this is a really important question. So look at this graphic here where we've kind of talked about what we mean by a charger. So here's the how we've defined them. So what what's a station location? What's a port or what you you know, what is a charger and what's a connector, right? So when we talk about a dual port, we're talking about a charger that has that has the ability to charge two cars at the same time. So think of it in terms of how many cars are receiving a charge at the same time. Um, and so if this one physical charger, in this case, this is a single port charger, no matter how many connectors it has, if it can only charge one car at a time, then that's a single port charger. And then if you look at this charger over here to the right, that regardless of how many connectors it has, it can charge two cars at a time at a minimum of 50, 50 kW, which I, I've seen in Hilliard. I, I live in Hilliard and in, in, Columbus, in the suburban Columbus, and I've seen one at the Electrify America station, and they have these. And so these, these would count this would count as a dual port charger. Again, thank you for the question because I'm sure others on the call have something similar. This is a very important clarification. Yeah, I know there were a couple of people who wanted that clarification, so thank you again for going over that. Um, this question also was kind of covered, but I can understand uh, this question as well. Can you clarify whether a car dealership that offers 24 seven access to the public is eligible to apply for chargers in its customer parking area? This person was concerned about statement five, statement on page five of the RFA. It says parking facilities serve tenants of a single landlord or employees of, or customers of a single business are not eligible for funding. Yeah, so that's that's again, that's a really good question. I would say that a car dealership that does not limit anyone from charging at that spot, and we have a few here in Columbus uh, that I'm aware of, if it's outside the fence and if any member of the public can pull up to that spot and charge there, that would be eligible. The only thing that I would caution is that, um, you know, EV owners are an active bunch. So if people show up multiple times and they see the same car dealers, their own staff or you know it's always kind of dominated even at eight o'clock at night or ten o'clock at night it's always occupied by somebody one of their vehicles or something like that and then we'll hear about it so that's one of the kind of sort of almost like a a reminder that we 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 make before we sign a grant agreement with somebody in that stead but strictly from an eligibility standpoint um, car dealerships would be eligible as long as the charger is publicly available to any member of the public 24 7. thank you uh next question is distance to a highway calculated from an exit on ramp or just from the roadway um <laughs> that's a that's a good question i'd have to go back to odot we're leaning we're we're, we're working closely with odot so I know some highway ramps are pretty long, uh, so I can go back and, and take a look at that. I, I understand that if I had to put my finger on something today, I would be that I would say that 
it's from where you exit the highway is where they calculate the distance. But that again is something that we can confirm and we'll put all these answers to these questions in a responsiveness uh, summary document. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that. Thank you. If our location is near many classifications, but farther from class one than class three, how does that score? Can you say that again, please, Ryan? Sure. If our location is near many road classifications, but farther from class one than class three, how does that score? They're closer to many road classifications. So hopefully I'm going to answer this question uh, to your satisfaction, but what what I'm what we're saying is that when you identify a location, well, you can go about this two ways. One is you have a location in mind, right? So you can use the ODOT Thames map, and it has a really cool tool that you can then draw lines and figure out your way to the closest functional class six road or seven or five or four or three or two or one. And so you would figure out between the eligible roads, functional class one, two or three, are you within two miles of one of those three things? That's your first step, right? This, this, then my location is eligible. Now, if that same, if, if you're now up against somebody who you're close within two miles of a functional class three road, someone else is within two miles of a functional class two road in your county, somewhere in your vicinity, they will obviously score higher in the ranking process, right? So that's how I would do it. Now, here's the reverse of that. You don't have a location identified yet. You have three months to do all of this stuff and put an application together. So you want to go ahead and start off with a functional class one road in a particular county that has few chargers and start with that and start to look at what's around there and what could be potential um, locations that would be good to put a charger on. And obviously the, cl the closer you are to a higher functional class road, the higher you're going to rank. Uh, next question is, where can we find information on where the EV corridor is located? Oh, that's a good question. The best source of EV corridor information is always your municipal planning organizations. Um, whichever MPO is in your region, I would reach out to them because again, that's somewhat of a not not an on a daily basis but that's some of a, what of a moving thing as well as the corridors get developed um so but again for your purposes if you talk strictly about our rfa actually shows you um again the functional class one two and three roadways and so that i can tell you pretty much most functional class one roads i want to almost say every one of them but i'll stop short of saying that most functional class one roadways are also designated EV corridors, either signage pending or signage ready, uh, but that in my recollection, but the best place to go is your municipal planning organization in your region and they should tell you exactly um, where things stand. Thank you. Our utility upgrades make ready. Of, sorry, our utility upgrades make ready eligible for reimbursement. Yeah, so th that's a that's a good question too. So it depends on what type of utility upgrades. If the upgrades are on the site that we're talking about, then they're definitely eligible. Now, I will say to you that particularly if you're a non-government entity, we prefer that that fall within the 20% or, or cost share that you're going to provide. But if they're within, like, the short answer is if they're on the site, then they're eligible. If you can show us and prove to us that this is specific to bringing EV charging here. Uh, if they're offsite and in the real world, sometimes there's a need to make an upgrade somewhere else further away. They're not on the same site, but that is connected to this, uh, to making this work, then we would not be able to reimburse that cost. Thank you. If we receive a grant to install DC fast chargers adjacent to existing level two chargers, which already contain 180A compliant space, do we need to provide an additional 80A compliant space with the DC fast chargers? Yes. So we're going off of usage and the ability for people with disabilities to use these chargers that we fund. So I know that that's, you know, and by the way, that's a fair question because 
a lot of people associate ADA compliance spaces with a structure or a building and say, hey, I already have four ADA compliance spaces on my parking lot. Do I need to create a fifth one for this charger? So please understand our logic is that, I mean, our desire and our goal is that people with disabilities also buy electric vehicles and also have the ability to charge them. Um, so yes, so it is tied to the charging, uh, the charger and the parking spot designated for that charger. I also want to take this opportunity and thank the, the questioner for giving me this opportunity. We're asking these spaces to be ADA compliant, but not ADA reserved. So there's a distinction. They have to be sized. They have to have the access lane and so on so that a person with a disability can pull up and charge their vehicle. They don't have to be reserved only for people with disabilities, if that makes sense. So if we're just putting two chargers in a location and if one of the two chargers is reserved, then that is sort of counterproductive or that may not be the best use of, of our you know, investment in terms of allowing people to use the chargers. So again, they have to be um, ADA compliant, but not ADA reserved. Yes, definitely an important distinct distinction. Thank you. Um, are there restrictions on the price of charging passed to charger customers? For example, if installing a charge point charger on the charge point network, are there restrictions on the end user price as a percentage of electrical cost? Um, generally, what we've done is that we've stayed out of uh, and, and we've checked with a number of other states as well. Uh, we've we have not put a restriction on the pricing of usage of the charging equipment, certainly not in the RFA, uh, but that is something that we hear from people about. That is something that you know, folks say, hey, if this is quote unquote public money, it's not exactly public money, but it's money that's intended for the public, um, then um, should the state of Ohio also say you cannot charge more than this per that metric? Or, uh, but at this point, the RFA does not uh, put a restriction. Obviously, um, people in this business know good and well that uh, pricing often impacts uh, the usage that you're going to get for your charger. So. Long answer is what I gave. The short answer is no, we have not put any restrictions on the pricing. Thank you. A lot of good questions and thanks for hanging in there, Aloud. Um, the last two questions looks like uh, do we do you have installation case study examples to help us understand installation costs and ongoing costs? The local electric tariff is very confusing for distribution costs. Yeah, I mean, that's that's again a good question. And uh, the short answer again is no, we don't have case study examples, but I can assure you that um, between, um, there's a lot of people in Ohio that are very engaged in this. And between uh, a few vendors that you're considering, your municipal planning organization, your Clean Cities Coalition organization in Ohio, uh, between those groups that you can get a really good sense of what what it takes and 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 absolutely conversations with your electric utility for um, cost uh, of uh, both installing as well as operating costs associated like demand charges and so on. I mean, those are important considerations for an applicant to keep in mind. Again, uh, we tend to focus on this more from sort of an air quality kind of perspective. So. Uh, we're not prescriptive about this um, and so yeah so the organizations i mentioned should be uh, better able to help you and we made sure that every one of them got a copy of the rfa or the notification of the rfa thank you our previous ohio epa grant recipients from the level two program able to apply and are they ranked differently um, we um, have, so from, let's answer that question in two ways. One is from an eligibility standpoint, we have not limited anyone from applying. So if someone um, applied for and received a level two grant, we have not positively or negatively pointed that out. Uh, again, we see DC fast chargers as meeting a different need. Um, and uh, so we have not. Now, having said that, we reserve the right that if someone's ever been a grantee of our office, 
whether it's this program or any other program, and if they've underperformed, they've not performed, they've not done the work, or they've done work that has been really not the best use of, of, of our funding, then we reserve the right to not fund uh, that applicant again. Okay, thank you. Um, just had one typed in, should be the last, I think. When following Appendix B of the RFA overview PDF, the closest charger is a level two charger that reports, quote unquote, public call ahead. Two part question. Public call ahead, is that equivalent to public for the purposes of following Appendix B and are we to list the closest level two or level three charger? Okay, so if I uh, heard the question right, so if there, if someone is marked public call ahead, then I'd be curious about, I'd make that call and find out what call ahead means. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, again, I mean, if it's limited hours or something like that, then that's uh, an update that we should make and uh, take them off the list, if you will, for consideration. Um, so that's one. The second part was, are we to list the closest level to a level three charger? We're just talking about level three chargers only. I think that question was asked before as well. Um, yeah, having a level two charger close by um, it does make a little bit of difference. It provides something, but again, I mean, I'm trying to envision uh, one person trying to get home 11 p.m. somewhere uh, needs to get on and off and get just get enough charge in 20, 30 minutes or so to, to make it home. So we're not we're only counting level three chargers or DC fast chargers. Thank you and thank you everyone for your questions. Cool. So did we get through all of them? I think so. All right. Well, I'll take a minute and then just thank everybody for participating. Uh, some really, really good questions. We will take um, these questions back and take a harder look at them. We'll put them in a responsiveness summary, if you will, or a Q&A document is what we call it. It's a living document and we keep updating it. And every time we update it, we notify our, um, uh, you know, our stakeholder list, if you will. So please, you know, keep an eye out on our website. Please keep an eye out for the Q&A document. Uh, you guys really have asked some really, you know, some good questions that we're going to go back and take a look at. So, and finally, certainly appreciate your hanging in there with us. Uh, it's almost 3.30. Um, so thank you for joining and um, um, we look forward to hearing from you well before the application deadline. We look forward to your questions um, and um, thank you. And, and, and let's get these chargers deployed out there. <laughs>